All right. How are we feeling? Good. Um, just so I know who I who I'm talking to. Um, how many of y'all are required to be here because of class? Okay. Cool. Um, how many of y'all would would describe yourself as an artist of some sort? Okay. Three ish. Don't be shy. Um, that can include like claymation, Instagram videos, or whatever it is that, that you make. Um, so yeah, my name is Jack Roppers. My job here at Calvin, uh, I run the Student Activities Office, um, which means a lot of different things to people, mainly uh, running weekend programming events, concerts, and movies. Um, our office attempts to uh, help Calvin students reimagine what their relationship with pop culture looks like uh, through the lens of faith. And part of that uh, is asking the question, what does it look like to be a responsible listener or a responsible audience member? Um, and I think part of it for me personally and, and from our office is what does it look like to be a responsible artist? Um, when we are interacting with artists and trying to decide is this artist the right person to bring to campus, um, we are asking, does this person, will this person bring something to the conversation uh, at Calvin that will be edifying to the campus? Um, or is this person bringing something to the campus that is going to get me in trouble? And if it's going to get me in trouble, is it getting me in trouble for the right reasons? Um, and uh, one of those things that has been an interesting uh, word that has popped up over the years has been this idea of cultural appropriation. Um, and so I'm going to speak, because not all of you are artists, and some of you are just here because you have to be here, um, I'm going to speak a little bit from the uh, perspective of, of an artist, um, and what does it look like to create something um, without appropriating other cultures. Um, and I'll also speak a little bit of what does it look like as a listener, as somebody who is um, engaging with different artists, uh, that you're not sure, is this person appropriating a different culture or not? How should I engage with someone who does, et cetera? Um, so this is, a, this is kind of the, the short schedule. We won't be here till five, so if you chose this one because you're like, this one's definitely gonna be short, you were right. Um, so I'll, I'll do a, a quick summary of like, how do people define appropriation? Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about finding uh, the line between appropriation and appreciation. Um, and, uh, I don't know why the third one is there, it shouldn't, and it has a typo. Um, but why does it matter to me and some personal reflections about uh, what it's like to make music in, in this current climate. Um, so, let's start with defining appropriation. Does anyone feel like they want to take a crack at it? Eyebrows, eyebrows. Here's the first time that I encountered it. Uh, I was walking through um, the streets of San Francisco and this isn't the mural that I saw, but it's a, it's a, very, uh, a very close mural that was redone. And I, I ran into this, this mural on a wall that says, Imitation is the whitest form of flattery. Um, and in it, uh, you've got some pictures of uh, Elvis, and uh, maybe that's Jack Sparrow, you've got Bjork. Um, Various different uh, Vanilla Isis there, Miley Cyrus. Um, and I remember walking through it, and the one that I saw, I think in a place where my, Miley Cyrus is, uh, had a picture of, of Macklemore in it. Um, and this was uh, right after Macklemore had won a Grammy for the best hip hop album over Good Kid Mad City, uh, Kendrick Lamar's record. And I began to question is there a reason why, like, Macklemore would be in there, but Eminem would not be in there. And so, uh, my first encounter with this idea of cultural appropriation uh, was kind of like, there are some artists that, that do this thing, and there are some that do a very similar thing, but it's not necessarily counted as cultural appropriation. Um, which made me question, is this simply like, because Eminem's a better rapper than Macklemore? Um, or is it because something else is at play here? Um, so uh, doing some digging within my, my own work as a, a booker here at Calvin, but also as a musician, I began questioning, am I doing the very thing that these artists are doing? Um, am I taking someone else's uh, 
culture, some, something else that belongs to a different culture and making my own. Um, perhaps my, my favorite conversation with this was with um, Kaya Cater, who's an, an artist uh, that we brought in last January for January series, um, who plays the banjo. And when I talked with Kaya, she uh, was mentioning that she, she grew up in Canada, but went to school in the Appalachian Mountains and was learning the banjo and was struggling uh, as a person of color to, to make sense of like, why am I learning this white instrument? Um, but then like began to do some deep diving and realized, oh, the banjo is not a white instrument. Um, and, and if you are to take you know, 20 minutes of Google searching, you will quickly find that most uh, music forms that we listen to, celebrate, are, are in our pop music uh, conversation. Um, do not originate with white Europeans. Um, and that's why this gets a little complicated and why it's, it's kind of an interesting topic and one that uh, I found actually to be a little bit more life-giving than like terrifying. I, I entered into this conversation thinking, uh, oh man, I'm gonna find out all the ways that I've done it poorly. And instead, uh, it's, it has been more of an invitation to how might I lean into um, appreciation versus appropriation? So here are a few uh, definitions that, that I've run into. Um, this is kind of my personal one. So cultural appropriation is when someone from a majority culture co-opts something from a minority culture that the majority culture previously looked down upon. Um, this usually involves making a profit off of that piece of culture while disregarding where the piece of culture came from. So, for example, uh, we'll pick on Elvis. Um, so Elvis uh, is, is famous for being the king, the king of rock and roll. Um, and yet, what Elvis was doing was taking a popular form of music um, that had come out of the black church in America um, that was combining uh, soul and jazz and folk music. And uh, he was taking that utilizing some of the same dance moves, some of the same guitar chord structures, um, some of the same stru song structures, and turning it into something that became what we know as rock and roll. Um, now, previously, um, you would have probably walked into white spaces where that was not something that was acceptable in a white space. And yet, because Elvis did it, and did it and made it look cool and made a ton of money off of it, um, all of a sudden it was a socially acceptable thing. So Elvis being from the majority culture, co-ops something from a minority culture um, that was previously looked down upon and then makes a profit off. Um, here's another definition uh, that I found. This is from the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, cultural appropriation is taking an aspect of culture and not knowing the historical implications of that culture and refusing to actually do the, in, the actual research. Um, uh, a, Great example of this is um, the oh man, I'm blanking on her name. Adele. Um, how many of you all saw the Adele image? Here we got to see it in the piece lines. Um, this was two summers ago, and she's wearing a Jamaican flag uh, bikini, and she has her hair done up in knots. And uh, when asked uh, by the press, like, "Hey, Adele, what's going on here?" Um, didn't necessarily have the right she didn't know what culture she was taking from, um, and all of a sudden she's in hot water because people are like, hey, this might be appropriation. And then people are looking at her tone of voice and saying, is this appropriation? So again, uh, it's not just that she took an aspect from a culture, but she took an aspect from another culture without knowing the historical implications of that hairstyle um, and singing pattern um, and refusing to actually do the research and say, hey, you're right, this is something that I participated in and I didn't know. Um, the third one uh, is from Nadra Kareem Niddle that says, uh, cultural appropriation is the adoption of certain elements from another culture without the consent of the people that belong to that culture. And this is where things get a little messy for me, to be honest. Um, because, uh, Consent is a strange word to use here, um, because uh, how do you ask a culture for their consent? 
Um, and yet, I think this is where we get in the sticky point. And why I'm, I'm not necessarily interested in, and there are more smarter people and better people for addressing like cultural appropriation as a cultural level, but as somebody who's making something, um, it's, this, this definition can be difficult to deal with. Um, for example, um, I will listen to an artist who has, uh, for example, when you walked in, you were listening to Michael Kiwanuka, who is a, an amazing folk artist from the UK. Um, in his uh, second record, which came out like six or seven years ago, he's got this amazing string section that, that opens up the record. And then there's this uh, four or five piece choir that comes in. And the way that they add reverb to the voices on the choir, they do these really short, like um, high pitched notes that echo like what his melody is doing. Um, where like you hear it and it feels like massive, but it's only short. I don't know how to do that, I'm not a music producer, but uh, at the time that record came out, um, I was in the studio making a record and uh, was like, I really want the choir piece to sound like this record. Now, if I were to take this, uh, idea of I need consent from Kiwanuka, um, it would be very hard for me to reach out to him. Um, I've tried to book him at Kelvin and that's even hard. Um, um, but as just a, a, a nobody who's making making a record, uh, it's, it's a little harder. And it's harder to say, where did he get that piece of musical production? Is it is it from a specific culture? Um, so obviously some of these definitions can get a little bit messy and muddy, but there are some that are very easy. Now, uh, whenever somebody talks about cultural appropriation, the next question of pushback that comes in is this idea of, what about America, the greatest melting pot, where all cultures come together? Um, I had a student who asked me when I told him I was doing this, like, what do you think about fusion genres? Um, what about our globalized society? Uh, Spotify does this. I don't know if, if any of these students know this, but Spotify uh, sends out data on Gen Z every year. Um, I don't know if I've just signed up for their email list or somehow, but I get like data on what Gen Z like listening patterns are every year. And one of the interesting things that came out, I, I couldn't find it in the, the data as I was like preparing for this, is the amount of genres that the majority of the music that is being made uh, is no longer being made in the place where that genre originated. And I'm not just talking about like um, Memphis soul or like uh, Motown music, but I'm talking about like there's a unique form of house music that started in Johannesburg, South Africa, and the majority of it is being made in Germany. Um, and so the, the way that our globalized society has transformed where music is being made um, has changed this conversation. Um, and yet, um, it also requires us to be people who pay attention. Pay attention to, is this um, just an interesting new way to look at music that's inviting, or am I ripping off somebody else? And I would say, um, even though I think we're all called to this, it particularly calls to those of us who are in the majority culture to pay attention to what we're doing. Um, and if there's anything that you can learn by looking at me, it's I check out all the majority culture bingo boxes. Um, Here's, a, here's another definition uh, that, I, that I found helpful. Um, this is from a book called Who Owns Culture? Um, and it's uh, Susan Scafidi, I think is how you pronounce her name, is actually a, a lawyer who deals with like, copyright and things. Um, and she talks about like intellectual property and how you can copyright certain things and how you can't copyright other things. And uh, thinking about the unauthorized use, again, that, that idea of consent, of dress, language, music, culture, folklore, cuisine, traditional medicine, religious symbols. Um, it's most likely uh, to be harmful when the source community is a minority group that has been oppressed or exploited in other ways, or when the object of appropriation is particularly sensitive, sacred objects. Um, this is uh, why um, there are some things that may feel like cultural appropriation, um, but when we look at where is the power structure, um, that's when you can definitively see. Um, I, was, I was watching a, a piece by uh, I think it was PBS that was talking about um, 
found out. It's not big dog clothing. There's a clothing company that came out of, of Brooklyn that essentially, uh, in some ways, reappropriated preppy white guy culture um, and, and then sold it um, within the, the hip hop community in like the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and so they were like questioning, like, is this cultural appropriation? And often um, you can look and say, like, is this doing harmful things? And where is the power in this relationship? This guy in his in his tiny apartment making street clothing is probably not causing harm to, you know, preppy white guys. Um, and yet, like, he is taking something from this culture and using it within their own culture. So, with that being said, we can very clearly say, cool. So I shouldn't do this, or this, or here's Adele, or all of the terrible things that Fashion Week has been doing. But it gets a little bit messier when we talk about music, because it's not necessarily as neat. Iggy Azalea is a great example. Should she be allowed to make hip hop music? I would argue, yeah. She should be invited to participate in that drama. So why is she constantly being told that she's culturally appropriating? Um, and why is Eminem not? Um, you may not know this, um, but in 2000 and I think it was 2015, Iggy Azalea and Eminem were both up for rap album of the year. It was not a great year for rap music. Um, and uh, Eminem won that, and it kind of uh, felt like a um, uh, almost too late award for him, in, in that he probably should have won it for previous records. Um, but he happened to win that year. And there was a lot of pushback within the hip hop community that like Iggy Azalea was even mentioned. Like, in the, but there was not the same amount of pushback for Eminem. Now, that might be because Eminem is a better rapper. It's very possible that that's true. It also might be because Iggy Azalea um, is Australian, and when she speaks, she speaks with an Australian accent, and when she raps, she raps more like Patois, <laughs> um, and is not necessarily rapping in the tone that she speaks in. Um, and it might be because Eminem raps about things that are true within his own life, and Iggy Azalea raps about things that maybe she wishes were true in her own life. Um, now, I don't, I'm not like a scholar in Iggy Azalea. I don't know much about her, her music. But I do know that there was a, there was a significant amount of pushback um, when this was happening because she lacks the, the type of appreciation that maybe Eminem had. So what I want us to think about um, in our own lives, but in the, the pop culture that we consume and in what we create, is where is this line between appreciation and appropriation? And um, I'll, I'll sort of look at these, these definitions, and then I'm going to give you three examples that I think are shining examples of people from a, minority, or a majority culture that show how do you uh, appreciate a culture that, that you um, utilize and, and uh, create culture with um, versus appropriate. So appreciation seeks to acquire knowledge an understanding of another culture. They honor and respect that culture, its practices, and its history. Whereas appropriation uh, is when you take aspects without acknowledging its history or significance, and there's little intention in learning about that culture. When Iggy Azalea was pushed back about her use of patois in her songs, um, she would push right back and be defensive. Um, when Eminem would, uh, was pushed back about what do you mean you're a white rapper? This is what he had to say. I was used to reading things like that about me, but it hurt. I felt like Double uh, XL is, is a magazine, didn't know me to make that kind of judgment. Coming up, I had to deal with a lot. I wanted to be respectful because what I do is black music. I knew I was coming into it as a guest in the house. What I love about this quote is that uh, Eminem is realizing um, that he is not in his own sphere. Um, I, I think about this often, particularly in Grand Rapids, of how um, when I walk into a classroom at Calvin University, I do not think about my white skin. 
Um, and yet, our neighbors of color walk into places, particular places on, at, on campus, and have to think about the ways um, that their skin um, says something different to their neighbor than mine does. And yet, Eminem is doing that within a culture that is not its own. I don't know if, if any of you who belong to a majority culture have lived in a place where, um, where you are a minority, um, but it can be shocking um, to, to all of a sudden realize um, I'm thinking about my whiteness as I enter into this room, um, because most of us spend our entire lives not doing that. So my takeaway from Eminem in, in the ability to appreciate is know the history and know your place. Um, another thing, uh, this is after that um, 2015 Grammy Award. Um, <coughs> this is the Guardian is saying this about Eminem. Um, the main reason people aren't complaining about Eminem's victory is that quite simply he has unequivocally demonstrated his love for hip hop as a culture and a genre. He long ago recognized his white privilege saying, if I was black, I would have sold half. Um, and committed himself to the old-fashioned aesthetic of masterful lyricism. Eminem does not pretend, um, for the most part, to be black. I find his voice to be somewhat annoying, and I don't necessarily like his music all that much. But he doesn't pretend to be something that he isn't, um, which would be the difference between him and Nicky Azalea. Um, he raps about trailer parks and um, the culture that he grew up in in Detroit, and he doesn't rap about uh, a culture that is not his and is not his own. Um, he accepts that he is a guest in the house, um, which I find uh, to be somewhat refreshing. Um, a side note, I don't know that, I couldn't find any writing on this, but one of the things that I find really interesting about, particularly within, within rap, um, is this idea of the majority culture sort of pointing and looking down upon another culture. Um, so within, within hip hop music, uh, I remember when, um, when Macklemore dropped his record, um, being caught off guard by what was being played on the radio. Um, because Macklemore's first single was Thrift Shop, um, and what was being played on the radio at that point um, was not like the Kendrick Lamars of the world, um, but it was kind of like these you know, reused and recycled 50 Cent songs. Um, that were explicit, that were um, denigrating toward women, like, and so the juxtaposition between that and the Macklemore song was all of a sudden, Macklemore was taking this style of music and was making it almost clean-ish um, and almost like kind of silly, um, which it's, don't get me wrong, it's a fun, really catchy song, but all of a sudden on the radio what was happening is, is they were taking this thing that beforehand, like how many of y'all have listened to a radio station? Um, they don't do this as much anymore, but 10 years ago where they'd say, all of the top 40 hits without the rap, like they, those stations were then playing Macklemore songs um, because they were looking down upon this genre, but they're saying, hey, this fits our thing. And it just happens that he's white. Um, so uh, anyways, knowing your place, knowing um, are you a guest in this home um, and thinking about Am I a guest in places that maybe I didn't even know I was a guest in? Um, for example, uh, our good buddy Dave Grohl. Um, Dave Grohl is uh, the lead singer of the Foo Fighters, drummer for Nirvana. Um, and here he is in a conversation with Pharrell um, talking about uh, where he stole his drum beats from, which I find very fascinating. So, we'll, watch, we'll watch a bit of this. Well, I wanted to be a drumline kid. Like, I wanted to be a drumline kid. Why not? But I can't read music. I couldn't then. I still can. Now, all I wanted to do was be in a line of drummers all playing drums. I was decent. I wasn't, like, your level. Like, I'm... Dude, stop saying that I'm a good drummer because I'm the most basic fucking drummer. If you listen to Nevermind, the Nirvana record, I pulled so much stuff from The Gap Band and Cameo and Tony Thompson on every one of those songs. All that. That's wow. all it's all disco. That's all it is. <laughs> I do not hear that. Nobody makes the connection. That's straight up Gap Band. I told Tony Thompson that I came to my house for a barbecue with somebody, and I was like, man, I just want to thank you because 
you know, I owe so much, I've been ripping him off my whole life. He goes, I know. Whoa, a big disco flare. <laughs> like, it works every time. Here's, here's what I love about that. Um, Dave Grohl didn't have to do this interview, didn't have to admit that he was stealing things from disco, but he does. He owns that this particular piece of music inspired the way that he drums in one of the most seminal grunge bands in Seattle. Um, now, he's not making disco records. He was making grunge records and to some extent continues to make grunge records. Um, and this is an example of how do you give credit where credit is due, which is kind of my second um, invitation for people who are making things. If you're borrowing something from another culture and you're learning how to do your craft better from another culture, name that. Name it in your interviews. Name it in uh, your uh, in your you know album liner, whatever it might be, whatever you're making. Um, freely and willingly and regularly, like give credit to where credit is due. Um, now, this is where things get a little money though, because you could say, well, Dave Grohl appropriated. Nirvana made a ton of money off that record. Did they know they were gonna make a ton of money? I don't know, maybe not. Um, but I think that that line between appreciation and appropriating is that Dave Grohl knew his source material, was willing to say like, this is where I get the, got this from, was willing to say it to that person's face. It didn't sound like the person was like that cheerful about it. So maybe he didn't necessarily have that consent, um, but was willing to say like, hey, this is what inspired the way that, that I drum and, and change that. Um, so the first one, know your history. Know, are you a guest in this, this house? Second, um, give credit where credit is due. Um, the third, and this is my favorite one, I have a few things in my life that I'm like a lifelong fan of and people will send me like anything that has to do with these. One is I'm, I grew up in Orlando and I'm a huge Orlando Magic fan, which if you don't know is like a very bad basketball team. Um, and I'm also a very huge Bruce Springsteen fan. And I think Bruce is um, one of the most hidden uh, icons in what it looks like to show cultural appreciation. Um, Bruce grew up in Freehold, New Jersey, um, which if you've never been to Freehold, um, that's all of you. Um, it's not a place where the people visit. Um, and he would play at these clubs in the 70s uh, in Ashbury Park and would play with a, a rotating cast of, of uh, musicians that eventually, in the early stages of his band, Bruce Springsteen and the East Street Band, um, was a band of uh, uh, significant diversity for the 1970s. Um, when you would go to a, a, like, a show then, it was very much so segregated. When you would go uh, to listen to music, even at a soda fountain, it was very much so segregated. Um, and yet Bruce would show up to play these dive bar gigs with a band that was three white guys and three black guys. Now, the band didn't stay that way, and eventually uh, Clarence Clemens was the only um, person of color within that band. And yet, um, Bruce uh, would, would claim that like, Clarence was the other front man of that band. And have any of you seen Bruce Springsteen play live? No, you should do it at some point. You won't be along much longer, unfortunately. Um, I got to see Bruce play in uh, 2008, my high school graduation present from my father. Um, it was the last tour that Clarence was on, and Clarence would have this giant golden throne on the left side of the stage that was uh, complete with, with kind of these, these red velvet seats, and he, would, uh, he was old and uh, was I think 15 or 20 years older than, than Bruce and um, was clearly hobbling around a little bit. But he would come off his throne to play his solo and um, it was the loudest the, the stadium that I saw them in would get was when Clarence stood on the stage. And um, I say all this to say, if you are someone from the majority culture who wants to learn from other cultures how to work on your craft better, invite them into your creative process. Um, Therefore, um, if you are ever at a point where they're like, hey, it seems like you might be stealing something from my culture, um, you are in relationship with that person and um, not merely uh, taking something from them. 
And also, you are inviting them into your life. Um, one of the things that um, another Springsteen recommendation that I've gotten and I really loved is um, him and over, I think it was right before the pandemic started, him and Barack Obama did a like eight piece uh, podcast together where they talked about, it might have actually been in the beginning of the pandemic, um, just talked about their lives together. And um, one of the things that he, he does in that is talk about his relationship with Clarence and how um, that shaped his understanding of his own uh, biases and his own uh, almost realization to what it was like to be a black man in America. Because he would go, um, I would, he, he tells the story about um, going to play in, I'm, I'm blanking on the country, somewhere in Sub-Saharan Africa and going to play this show and uh, walking out and um, because of the segregated music in America, most of their fans at the time were white, and they walked out to uh, a crowd that was um, all Africans, and Clarence turned to him on stage and goes, now you know what I feel like every night. Um, and having that relationship invited Bruce into seeing his own uh, complicity in things and also seeing his own blind spots in things. And I think writing one of uh, one of few protest songs that to this day will make me cry um, called American Skin, 41 Shots, um, about a kid uh, or a guy being shot down in his own apartment <coughs> off, uh, off duty cops um, 41 times. Um, who are you inviting into your creative process? So why is this important to me? I, I mentioned it before. Um, I, when I'm not at Kelvin, um, I am writing music and um, I, I think about this a lot because I'm asking myself, who am I inviting into my creative process? How am I um, paying attention to the ways in which I'm learning from other cultures but not appropriating other cultures? Um, one of the more interesting experiences that I have with this is um, up in the right hand or left hand corner, you can see my friend Robert and I um, got a grant in 2020 to write a song together and wanted, and it was. The invitation was to write a song, a song of lament, and uh, but not something that was like meant for worship services. And I struggled with like, how do I write a song of lament um, while not using or stealing the timbre of lament from other cultures? And so Robert and I would, were sitting in my living room a lot of times with masks on since 2020, and going back and forth like, is this chord structure like? Am I ripping this off from somebody, or am I learning from them? And having to have those hard conversations um, around my living room of like, how do we do this well together? Um, and like, uh, Robert is an incredible singer and um, has led like gospel bands and at his church and also things that I've been a part of, but had never written a song before. And so wanting to write something with him that he was writing his own verse, and yet as somebody who had written a lot of songs was like kind of coaching him in that practice, like how do I do that well? Um, and through that practice I realized this is just complicated. Um, and this is why I think it matters if you want to create anything, um, this can be something that paralyzes us um, because we are so, particularly in this moment when um, the internet hypothetically gives everyone and anyone access to our lives at all times, um, uh, we are open to criticism from a lot of the people. Um, so here, here is sort of my personal advices from me, the songwriter, not as Jack, the student activities director. Um, number one, be in community with people who are not like you. This is whether you're an artist or not. Um, how are you avoiding the temptation to live within your own echo chamber? I think social media can uh, be great for some things, but the way that it is terrible for each and every one of us is it silos us into groups of people who think the exact same thing as us and often look the same as us and come from similar cultures as us. Um, how are you avoiding that by stepping into a community that does not look like you, by inviting people into your home, um, by being in relationships where someone's inviting you into their home and you are having conversations where you don't necessarily agree on everything um, and you come from different places. Um, one of the ways that I think this um, can uh, show up in good ways and bad ways is there's uh, 
whenever whenever something comes out about like sexual harassment, there's always some politicians like, as the son of a mother and the father of a daughter, like um, we do that thing, or like whenever there's uh, maybe somebody is is called out for cultural appropriation, they say, well, my one black friend said, and uh, I call this the Tom Brady rule. Um, have any of you seen the Tom Brady GQ cover of him on a farm? Um, Google it when you get home, if you dare. Um, I have a friend who actually uh, has a, a framed copy of it above his desk. And it's, it's a picture of Tom Brady on a farm, and he's holding a baby goat, and he has a, a very dirty, sleeveless, like cut off sleeves white shirt on it, and it's on the cover of GQ. <laughs> and he puts it above his desk because it reminds him um, you need to have people in your life that will tell you that's a bad idea. Um, and I think being in community with people doesn't just mean that I ask my one friend who I have uh, significant power over, um, do you think I can release this song or do you think I can say this and get, get away with it? But instead, I'm in community with people that will call me out when I'm doing something stupid. So for example, Robert and I, we put out the song and afterwards, <laughs> Um, there's a line in it that I say the word brother to. And he said, Jack, I hate that. And I was like, why didn't you tell me that before we released the song? But he was like, I'm so, he told me, I'm so tired of white people calling me brother without intention to live alongside me. Um, and because we lived in community together and worked really hard in the song, like he felt the freedom to say that to me, even though in that portion of our relationship, I was in a position of power because um, I was the one mainly writing music for the song, and he was kind of the featured artist of the band. In other ways, he, he has a position of power because he was my boss when I was folding towels at the gym. Um, but uh, have some people in your life that will say no. When you're in community with people that don't look like you, don't believe the same things as you, um, invite them to give you criticism because criticism is almost always a gift. However, sometimes it is not. Uh, if you attempt to create anything, it is highly likely that somebody online will be mean to you. Um, and those are the voices that uh, you do not want to be the de dominant voices in your creative process. You are not in community with those people. An example of this, um, when Patrick Leoyo was, was shot by the Grand Rapids Police Department um, on a Friday, following Wednesday, um, and I don't say this to prove anything, I, would, I marched alongside his mother in our neighborhood because it happened right down the street from where I live. That Friday, my band was set to put out a music video. I can't control when we put out music videos, can in some ways, but it's like, there's never really a good time in the news to put out any sort of music right now. And I got called a lot of names for putting out a song on the day that the police footage was revealed. I didn't know the police footage was going to be revealed when I announced the music video, and people were very angry at me. Those people are not in community with me. Um, and was I, like, panicking in my office? Definitely. Um, but at the end of the day, um, there are going to be people who are mad at you online about everything. I've been called a lot of names on the internet. Um, and uh, what matters is how am I uh, with the people that I'm in community with. now. There are some cases that if you have 100 people saying something to you online, maybe that's time for some self-reflection. But if it's one or two angry people um, who happen to also be in the majority culture most of the time, um, it might be um, an invitation to say, let me just reflect on this uh, with people who I'm actually in community with. Second piece of advice, um, and this is the one that maybe I'm not happy there's a camera here, is you need to be on the right shitty first drafts. Um, this is something that Anne Lamont, who's a writer, talks about, um, that almost all good writing begins with terrible first drafts. You need to start somewhere, starting by getting anything down on paper. Um, and the best part of a first draft is that you don't have to put it out there. So if you write a song and you are like, I'm not sure if I'm you know, making a hip-hop song that's stealing an Afro beat, and I just want it to be this really fun you know, house song that I'm, that I'm working on, then bring it to your community and say, hey, is this appropriation? Um, and don't do that before you even put the first beat down on the paper. Um, we, my band just put out a record on Friday, and there's a song in it 
um, that the first draft of it, there, there was a part that I had um, essentially was like, oh, I really like the sound of this, this part in, uh, in a Sam Cooke song. And I wanted to do something like that at the beginning of the song. And the first demo was like very much so like stealing from the Sam Cooke song. Um, if I had said, oh, I can't do that because I'm stealing from the Sam Cooke song, um, and you know, it's, I'm appropriating that culture, we would have never finished that song. We would have, it would have never even made it to the table. Um, now, the final product, product of that song sounds nothing like the Sam Cooke song. Um, and, and, yet, and it's one of my favorite songs from the record. So don't be afraid within your first draft to make mistakes. Um, when you press publish or you press send, and the internet makes this really weird because pressing send means it's immediately out there versus you have to wait for it to, you know, the lacquers to be finished and then it to be pressed in the vinyl and then you can send it out to people. Um, there's a little bit more immediacy with that. Then is the time to take a break to say, am I appropriating? Am I doing something here? Um, this is within music. Obviously within <coughs> dress codes, Adele uh, maybe didn't have a, a second outfit for that party and just showed up in her first, first draft and it was like, no, maybe you shouldn't have done that. Um, the third thing uh, that I'll finish on is this. Uh, as somebody in the majority culture who is a Christian, one of the greatest gifts that you can be given is to have someone tell you how they experience you. So if somebody in your community criticizes you, says you're appropriating, um, says uh, something that you said um, could be understood as hurtful, learn how to apologize and how to repent. Um, because it is way more life-giving um, to apologize, to repent, to say, man, that was really dumb. Here's my personal example. Um, my band, when I was in high school, was called The Pow Wow. It's pretty bad. At the time, I thought it was, it was kind of a nod to, um, there was a, a large seminal Native American population in Central Florida, and we would have they would do like powwow demonstrations at our middle school, and I loved how like everyone was invited to participate, and so I wanted our concerts to feel like that. And we did, I didn't have the, the language for this. Um, and uh, now when uh, I go back and people were like, oh, did you play in bands here? I go, yeah, a few different ones, um, which is not really true. Um, but part of that is like, I know now because um, Mainly, I've been called out on it. Like that, that was a terrible decision. Granted, I was a 15-year-old, so like I made a lot of terrible decisions between then and now. Um, but in our invitations uh, to receive criticism, is an invitation to then learn how to repent and say, "I need to pay attention to how I name things in the future." Um, instead of saying like, "No, it was appreciation." Like it was like I was trying to do this good thing. Um, it, that when somebody criticized me for that, it was an invitation to be like, oh crap, you're right. Um, now I can look into my own life and say, am I still doing that now? Am I still using the words that I take great pride in, uh, that, with songs that I'm writing, and am I um, appropriating other cultures? Am I writing things that can be seen as hurtful? And if so, how do I repent and, and change those things in my life? All that to say, if you are an artist or if you want to make anything, um, it is hard, it is difficult, and these fears can be paralyzing. But I promise you, if you are in community with people that look different than you, um, that come from different cultures, particularly if you're in the majority cultures, you invite them into a, a position in your life where they can tell you that thing is hurtful, that thing uh, that you're writing or you're making, um, it is a gift to, to be invited into those spaces with people. Um, and it's a gift to put up music knowing that um, it is beneficial to the communities that you're sending it out. So, any questions before we wrap? Yes? You mentioned you were going to talk a little bit about being a listener. Yes. Yeah, so uh, the, the same thing applies to listening. Um, It gets a little bit more more interesting in that way because, uh, or not more interesting, um, more complicated um, because uh, music has has changed dramatically how we have access to it. Um, 
the um, like South African house music like 15 years ago, none of us would have access to that. Um, and sometimes the way that uh, the internet has changed our access to things actually makes some versions of music actually more popular in other places. Like people, when they think of techno music, often think of like uh, like mid Eastern Europe, but like techno like originated in Detroit, but it didn't take off in Detroit. Like it was not popular in Detroit. Then it was brought to Europe and it like exploded in Europe. Um, and so being like a listener when it comes to cultural appropriation is, is often more difficult. It's not as clear. Um, there was recently a, a, a lawsuit with, um, oh, what's his name? Ed Sheeran and Marvin Gaye. Yes. Um, that was really interesting around this because essentially it was attempting to sue Ed Sheeran because he had taken this chord structure. Um, and that's where it's just complicated in that way because do we then say, I don't think I can listen to Ed Sheeran? Um, I would say yes, but not for that reason. Um, <laughs> I just do not like Ed Sheeran as a musician. <laughs> um, but I think. Uh, but I think that it gets complicated in that way because did Ed Sheeran purposely steal that chord structure? I, I don't know. Um, now after that, somebody actually utilized AI for a good thing for once and, um, and made it so uh, they copy, they copy, how do you, what's the past tense of copyright? Copyrighted? Copyrighted. Copy wrote. Copy wrote. <laughs> It's definitely not their own. Um, they copy wrote every chord structure using AI, the possible, and then they put it in the public domain so that no longer can you sue someone for stealing a chord structure. Um, because it's just, it's hard to not repeat chord structures. Almost, you know, 50% of the pop songs that you hear on the radio are going to be the same four chords. Um, so, with that being said, like, it, it can get messy around that. Now, there are clear, like, Iggy Azalea is a very clear space where it's like, this feels uncomfortable for, for everyone. And the opinion of, uh, of the majority of people is something about this is off. Um, Eminem is one that I've honestly struggled with um, and have not figured out um, how, to, uh, how to justify that until kind of researching for this and figuring out, oh, Eminem actually is pretty aware of of the fact that his success is moderately based on, if not a lot based on the fact that he's a white guy. Um, and the fact that consistently there are uh, like rappers who are like historically some of the greatest rappers of all time that continually support Eminem. Um, so that's evidence that this person has knows their guest and they know the, they know the place. Um, and so I think that is, is a benefit of things as well. Within rock music, it's, it's interesting, like, thinking about uh, this. I was talking to a student about it today. Like, I make rock records, and nobody would say, Jack, you're appropriating other cultures. But at some point, it was. And so part of this as a listener is also to sort of name when we hear something so that in 40 years, people's first, when they hear hip hop, they don't think, oh, that's the Macklemore genre, right? But instead, they, they listen to the people who are at the forefront of it. Um, and rock has not done that. Um, people, for the most part, experience rock as a white genre. Um, and I was going to talk about this um, a little bit, but I think one of the things that, particularly um, within the United States, that's happened um, with with whiteness is is in some ways uh, we're we attempt to recreate the Tower of Babel in our whiteness, and that uh, we take away any of the diversity that's within our experience as people coming from various places in Europe and we replace it with I'm just white. Um, and in doing so, um, we become part of the majority culture at the sacrifice of maybe familial culture or ancestral culture. And I think what's often lost in that is that we can say like, well, I can do this because I'm white. Um, and instead of saying, like, how do, does my family's culture, like, invite me to maybe think about this differently? When it comes to art and music, um, 
in particular. Um, I I didn't grow up in, a, in an artistically inclined family, but I was I'm 75% Dutch. I don't remember ever like when I was learning how to write music, having my parents say, like, let's explore the artistic roots of the Dutch people. Um, because we were we were white, we weren't necessarily Dutch. Um, and so uh, there was never an invitation to that. Um, so as listeners, um, like allow yourself to like, take in the beauty of the diversity of sounds that happens within music, um, because like that is the gift. I would also say on top of that, this is like my side of our note of why live music matters and why you should buy tickets whenever we bring it back to Kelvin. Um, live music is the greatest way for us to continually have diversity of sound within music because uh, music is created for the environment in which it is played. And if all music is only created for our tiny little AirPods, music will become more and more similar similar in the way that it's produced and written and, and sent out into the world. When we experience music in a variety of different places, like the Seatback Auditorium, or at a club downtown, or in somebody's backyard punk show, or at, um, we don't really have many great hip hop clubs anymore, but there used to be a, a, a record store right off Kalamazoo that, that I love to go hip hop shows at. Like when we have these different places, those create atmospheres in which different music can be performed. And so by supporting live music, you're actually supporting a diversity in music. Any other questions? Yeah. One is a comment and then there's a question. Yeah. So I really liked how you talked about relationships. <coughs> I think Anne Terry's is a mark is done best mm -hmm. in relationships, For sure. diverse relationships. I really like that about um, Eminem too, because he mm -hmm. surrounded himself with black artists. He worked with, like, he sort of like, grew up under their tutelage, mm -hmm. right? I think that's really important. Um, I'm thinking about when it's not majority culture mm -hmm. and minority culture. So like speaking of hip hop, funky drummer is sampled in everybody's songs, right? Mm -hmm. So like when, Break. what? Break. Yep. The most sample. yep, so James Brown, right? Mm -hmm. So why, so how do we like think about that? Or like from my own culture, right? Um, Asian cultures and broad spectrum, mm -hmm. my culture in specific, like we borrow, steal, I don't know, um, a lot of hip hop things as well. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. the, like the Indian rap culture is like booming right now. Yep. Um, how, do you have any thoughts about that or like how to think about that? Yeah, I think um, a helpful question for me is where is the power? Mm -hmm. um, and if if somebody is is borrowing or stealing something and is making a profit on it, then that is power in some ways. Um, celebrity is also power in our current culture, and so um, if a celebrity is is taking something from a, a culture, even though they may come from a minority culture, um, they have the, the power dynamic in that relationship itself. To be honest, I don't know <laughs> is, is part of it too, of when another culture wants, or another person from a culture wants to, to borrow or utilize a sound. Um, like how do they do that with faithfulness to that thing other than does this person know where that sounds from? Have they done the research? Do they know the place of that? Um, one of the wonderful things about hip hop is sampling, mm -hmm. and sampling can almost like trace back roots um, in a culture that has been robbed of its roots. Mm -hmm. um, and so, when you hear a, a sample from an old song, in um, like I, th I think of, even though this was not necessarily the most like critically acclaimed record, um, but when I hear a certain Otis Redding song, I just think of. Kanye and Jay-Z's Watch the Throne, and that music video for Otis on, on that record um, is almost tracing back lineage. So if you were to take a sample from another picture, <laughs> I think you have to be very, someone has to be very careful with that. Um, am I doing this because um, I feel like, because I want to pay homage to that culture, that moment, that artist, or am I doing this because I think it sounds cool? Um, and I think 
the Dave Grohl piece is, is really interesting in that in that he's doing it because it sounds cool, and he's doing it because that works, and he's and in some ways is paying homage to those people because um, that snare slap like that works within disco music and grunge music. Um, so as a listener, it gets it gets comp like you don't know necessarily what that artist is doing, but but. Uh, Sometimes, most of the time, people will get asked those sort of questions, and and uh, in interviews and things, and you can pay attention to. Are they super defensive about that? If you're super defensive, it probably feels like they probably know in some ways like, I'm doing something wrong. If they're saying like you're right, but that is taken from this other culture, and I'm super grateful for the way that that music shaped me as a kid, like that, to me at least feels like at least. Uh, they're knowledgeable and um, they're they're accepting their place with the middle. Um, I, th I was thinking about this the other day um, in a meeting. Somebody mentioned Kirk Franklin and his, his record that had Stomp on it. He's like a, a hip hop gospel artist that was like pretty influential in that market. Like we had that thing on repeat in our house all the time, and so I just know that parts of that shaped the way that I think about music. Um, and so I was thinking about this with our record, like how do I give homage to people that like maybe I'm not, aren't directly influencing or I'm not like, directly stealing that drum sample from or whatnot. Um, yeah, I want, there, yeah, there's just people who are not necessarily in the majority culture can steal from another minority culture um, and maybe feel like they can uh, get away with it because of that. And I would just, Ask about what is what is the intent here, and are you are you aware of that you're even doing that? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Other questions? Cool. Go make music. It's a wonderful and beautiful thing to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Okay.